Okay, so now what we've seen is we've seen how muscles uh, are innervated by motor units. The motor units comprise the full innervation of the muscle. And we've seen how the different types of motor units develop tension over time. Now, what happens if I say to you, contract your biceps as strong as you can? Make, make a muscle, OK? Well, you're, you're going to start out with no tension, because at rest, you have no activity. You should have no activity in your motor neurons. So no tension, no units activated. And the first ones activated are going to be slow motor units. And each slow motor unit is going to add a small increment in tension. All right? It's going to, this motor unit is going to get to tetanus. And then another set of S motor units will be added, and another set, and another set, and another set, and another set, and so on. And then you're going to start to get the addition of FR, fast fatigue resistant motor units. And they can make a slightly larger increment. So now tension's going up a little bit more. And finally, you're going to bring in the big guns, which is the uh, fast fatigables. And they are going to make a big, big jumps. And you're going to then reach the maximum of the, of the muscle, the maximal possible contraction. This SFR to FF is called orderly recruitment. And orderly recruitment is the rule. And we're going to look at a few things about this. It's a very important concept. Um, first of all, this, this, is, this makes so much sense. It's essentially the motor version of Weber's law in that let's say there was an orderly recruitment. Let's say it was a hodgepodge that, so that back down here, we could get an, an FF motor unit activated. And then randomly, we would go back to, say, an S. Well, that would give you a very haphazard development of muscle tension. You know, it would be jerky. You'd have a big, big increase followed by not much, followed by another big increase. It's not smooth. This is a smooth development. The other thing that this um, orderly recruitment prevents is that, that you have FF way out here. Do you really want to add on a tiny little amount that's not going to do anything? So this is, this is the wrong time to bring in slow motor units. This is the right time to bring in slow motor units. OK, so, motor, so orderly recruitment makes sense. The second point that I will make is that this appears to have a, a very uh, interesting um, mechanism, uh, underlying mechanism which is that the input resistance is highest uh, uh, middle, intermediate, and lowest. And, that, and the way that input resistance is thought to vary is also related to the size of the cell. So these motor neurons are the biggest, these are intermediate, and these are the smallest. And if you go back to our neural communication lectures, what you'll remember is that the specific resistance um, is constant. And so a bigger cell will have a lower input resistance than a smaller cell. It's the same specific resistance spread out over a larger area or a smaller area. Um, and so uh, because. V equals IR, if the resistance is higher and the current is the same, the voltage, is going, which is the synaptic potential, is going to be the biggest in, in these guys at, at, um, before it will, it will become, um, before the, these guys will be activated at currents before these guys are activated or these guys are activated. OK. Um, and the final thing that I'll say about orderly recruitment is that it is the case in two really important types of movements. One is the stretch reflex. We know that the stretch reflex engages motor units according to orderly recruitment. And the other one is uh, movements that are 
are uh, dictated by descending control from, for example, the uh, the, um, uh, the the motor the primary motor cortex. Okay, so primary motor cortex input onto a motor neuron pool will engage first S and then FR and then FF motor units. Okay, one final uh, tidbit that's really fun is that if you take a sedentary person and that sedentary person is asked to make the maximum potential contraction, maximum contraction they can make with a muscle, what you'll find is that they, that they engage all of their S, all of their FR motor units, and then something like 80% of their fast fatigable uh, motor units. Then that person lifts weights, does a nice workout, works out, lifting weights. For three weeks thereafter, you get to 100% FF recruitment. <laughs> That's a cute trick. So it stays with you for quite a while. Um, and, uh, and so as, as long as you work out, you will, be, you will be able to recruit all of your fast fatigable motor units. If you're sedentary, um, about 20% of them are going to be offline at, uh, at, at any given time. Um, in addition to uh, facilitating full orderly recruitment, full recruitment of all the motor units, working out weight-bearing strength also has the effect of increasing, increasing the number of doublets. Increasing doublets. And we're going to just go back to the slides for one moment. OK. So these are doublets. And the, and the, in, uh, the uh, occurrence of these doublets increases greatly after just a single bout of weight bearing, uh, weight, weight lifting, weight, weight bearing exercise. Um, so fun facts for you to use in your own lives. OK. One final thing to know is that the orderly recruitment is going to mirror is going to be mirrored by the dropout. So, you recruit first F S motor units, then F R, then fast fatigables, and then you stay steady for a while. The first ones to drop out are the fast fatigable. The next to drop out are the fat fatigue fast fatigue resistant, and the final to drop out way way longer. Uh, after a way longer time are those slow motor units. So you're going to you're going to recruit and drop out in a mirror way. Okay, next what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce you to EMG testing. <laughs>